400 people from the UK have been have taken part uh, in fighting with ISIS. We are an Islamic arm and a state that has been accepted by a large number of Muslims worldwide. A tight grip on the truce. Despite some scattered fighting, the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine goes into its third day, with now some people returning to their shattered homes. And more airstrikes hit Iraq as Washington steps up its offensive on radical Islamist fighters to stop them seizing a key dam. Generally speaking, it's brand suicide now to be called ISIS because the key ISIS logo is the beheading. And who wants to be associated with that? Also, far-right activists clash with police in the French port of Calais, uh, where thousands of migrants are waiting for their chance to enter Britain. And a journey to the centre of the Earth. One of the world's most inaccessible volcanoes has been conquered by two US explorers. Uh, one of them told us here at RT International how it feels to stand on the edge of the abyss. Your Monday morning headlines here on RT International. From me, Rory Suchet, and the entire news team, a very warm welcome to you today. In Ukraine, the conflicting sides do remain committed to the ceasefire that was agreed upon on Friday, though sporadic fighting has broken out, with the army and anti-government forces blaming each other. The negotiators are set to resume talks on prolonging the truce uh, later this week. And with, tr uh, with hope, sir, the ceasefire will hold some of those who earlier fled the conflict zone are now cautiously returning. In many cases, though, they're finding heaps of rubble where their homes used to be. But residents are trying to restore some semblance of normal life. They have already started to clean up. Yeah, here, right there, you can see explosives being cleared in the areas where the most violent fighting took place in recent weeks. Anti-government fighters are now diffusing the unexploded mortar shells and other ammunition that litter the streets. But even as they leave the front lines, many still doubt that the truce will hold, as Artis Paula Slea now reports. Yesterday we buried a friend. He was killed when a tank fired from 100 meters away. His nickname was Electron. The last night before the battle, we sat together and smoked in the trench. In the morning, he died. For five long months, this has been the brutal reality for these frontline soldiers. They've stared death in the face and ache with the pain of losing comrades. It's very difficult to explain. If you weren't with us, you wouldn't understand. It's like losing a hand or when they tear your heart out. Anger and faith have kept Svarnoy strong. A father of four, he's doubtful the ceasefire will last. We have something they don't have, and they have something that we don't have. We have faith in victory and that we're fighting for our land. They have the equipment, simple metal, but no soul. Svardanoi volunteered for a fighting unit, knowing very well that the chances of being killed, injured or kidnapped were high. I'm ashamed of the actions of the Ukrainian army. We didn't come to Western Ukraine and begin destroying what they built. They came to our land. Gvost has gotten used to sleeping with grenades next to his bed and fears that death is never far away. This bed you are sitting on is the bed of my friend Doc. Just today he came back from the hospital. Both of his legs were injured. Gvost too is unsure the truce will last. There's been too much killing for either side to trust the other, he says. He never told his parents he was here, as he didn't want them to worry. And he also hasn't spoken with his wife and three children in a very long time. His baby daughter is just eight months old. People who have never seen this think war is like TV. You watch and forget because there's some entertainment show later. Here, everything is reality. Here, people are dying in front of your eyes. Antonia had never picked up a gun until this war. The months away from his wife and two children were often intolerable. 
They are far away and I'm talking to them when it's possible to turn on the phone. When we are going to the front, the phones are always off. He too has watched his friends die on the battlefield. Here you understand who your real friends are. All those who are with me here are my brothers, those who will put their bodies in front of me so I won't get shot. Unlike his comrades, Antonio thinks this time the truce might last, that finally the Ukrainian government realizes it has no other choice. Every fighter here is a volunteer, responding, they say, to the call of their hearts to protect their family, homes and land. For now, things are quiet. But the air is thick with the unanswered question if it's game over, or if these soldiers will be forced back to the front. Polislia RT, Donetsk, Eastern Ukraine. The European security watchdog, which helped to broker the truce, has now released details of the peace plan agreed upon in Minsk on Friday. At first, the sides agreed to an immediate end to the fighting. In a big concession move by Kiev, the plan also grants special status to restive regions with early local elections to be held. Also, the truce would be observed by European monitors. Kiev and anti-government leaders also vowed to exchange all detainees and pull back all military hardware. A foreign affairs analyst in Neboja Malich told us what he thinks is actually behind the Ukrainian government's concessions. The forces dispatched at the end of June after another false ceasefire to take these regions by force have suffered a catastrophic defeat on a tactical, strategic and operational level. You've, you've had thousands of these people surrounded and um, captured their equipment. Essentially, the Ukrainian army, um, the, the regular army, has been soundly defeated, uh, as have been the Nazi battalions as well as the National Guard. And essentially, at the point where the Ukrainian military front started collapsing, uh, Kiev suddenly decided to accept a truce. So at this point, I believe they're trying to hold on to this ceasefire uh, to give themselves a chance to regroup and figure out where to go next. Because obviously their strategy of repressing these people by force has failed. Now, NATO has voiced its support of Ukraine throughout the crisis, though always blasting Russia for its alleged involvement. But if Kiev actually becomes a part of the military alliance, how would that change the international arena? Well, uh, that is certainly the question that we're asking you, and you can share your opinion on it right now at RT.com. Let's bring up the results for you right now. Uh, half of you saying that it would uh, begin a countdown to the Third World War, and uh, just over 20% of you uh, saying it would just anger Russia and undermine regional stability. 17% uh, here thinking it would give more power to America, forging a unipolar world. And uh, the rest of you thinking, though, that it would increase security in Europe and actually counterbalance Russia's power. We love it when you get involved. Do cast your vote at RT.com. A military alliance in search of an identity. For over two decades, NATO has had branding issues. To justify its existence, it absolutely needs an enemy. In the wake of the Ukraine crisis, Russia now fits that bill. Now, Washington has launched fresh airstrikes against Islamic State militants in Iraq to prevent them from seizing a key dam in the west of the country. Now, that's as U.S. officials say it may take up to three years to destroy the extremist group that's also commonly known as ISIS. In the meantime, though, companies unfortunate enough to share the same name as the militant group are doing all they can to avoid bad uh, connotations. Uh, investigating for us, Artis Pauli Boyka. She's an Egyptian goddess worshipped as the ideal mother and protector of children. But dark forces have usurped her name. ISIS is now best known as a barbaric terrorist organization, running riot in Iraq and Syria and beheading US journalists. But what if it happens to be the name of your company? So you see on here, we just had the word ISIS and then the word mag was very, very small. And we realized that, no, we can't go to print with, you know, with this layout. We had to incorporate mag in the actual title, ISIS. ISIS mag in London was supposed to be about hair and beauty for women of African descent. We wanted our readers to, you know, unleash the goddess within them. So that was basically how we got the name ISIS for the magazine. We started getting um, messages via our Facebook page that we were part of the terrorist organization, and that wasn't cool. And we've worked really hard, so I said, OK, to my business partner, we have to make a change and we have to rebrand. It's not surprising that 
the threat posed by this terrorist group is giving businesses with the same name pause for thought. The problem is if you leave customers or potential customers with the idea that you might have some kind of connection um, or that they just feel uncomfortable when they've got choices about who to go to. This is a promo for a cardless payment app. The ISIS mobile wallet is a free app available for use with many of the latest smartphones. The US startup has announced that it's changing its name because it has no interest in sharing it with a terrorist organization. This development of condominiums in Florida used to be called ISIS Downtown, but it was swiftly changed to a much more vanilla 333. Generally speaking, it's brand suicide now to be called ISIS because the key ISIS logo is the beheading, and who wants to be associated with that? This is every business's worst nightmare has just happened. It's staring them in the face. It's happened before. The best case is Jaguar, who originally called SS Cars. And, of course, they had to change their name, and under the advice of an advertising agency, they became Jaguar, and they adopted the new brand logo of the Jaguar, but they are SS cars originally. But rebranding is a luxury. It can cost millions of pounds. It means entirely new packaging, websites, designs and logos, and it could still be too late. British retailer Ann Summers have just released a new range of underwear called Isis. You can see they haven't had time to change the poster, so they've just blanked out the name in the shop window. But it makes you wonder what the Islamic terrorists hell-bent on subjugating women to Sharia law would make of the Isis lingerie. A spokesperson for the company has explained that the name was chosen long before the product hit the shelves, before the terrorist group rose to notoriety. They've acknowledged the unfortunate timing of the product. Being mistaken for racy underwear is perhaps an inconvenience for the terrorist group as well. They've rebranded to IS, which stands for Islamic State. But names can be hard to shake. Turn on any news report and you'll hear references to the Islamic State preceded by the group formerly known as ISIS. They've changed their name, but not their tactics. Polly Boyko, RT, London. And the psychologist Nikolai Senels told us why those who serve time in prisons like Guantanamo Bay are prime targets to be recruited by extremists. Being in the prison does not make them less angry with, uh, with the Western world and so on. And coming out from there again, uh, many of them are, are perceived as martyrs from their, from their jihadi connections and so on. And this way, already there, they have a higher status in, in the jihadi communities and of course they are very welcome uh, to get back into that and I, and, and I assume that they are also invited to come back. An RT's uh, Sophie Shefanadze certainly picking apart the Western response to the Islamic State offensive with retired U.S. State Department official Anne Wright. Here's a quick look. The instability that has been caused by uh, the United States uh, starting uh, 10, 11 years ago in 2003 with the, uh, with the uh, U.S. invasion and occupation of, uh, of Iraq. Uh, and uh, earlier than that, the um, uh, U.S. going into Afghanistan after the events of 9-11. All of those events have, have triggered a large number of uh, people from the Arab and Muslim worlds who have uh, said to the United States, we don't like what you're doing in those areas, uh, to, uh, to act as, as mercenaries for uh, whomever wants to hire them. Thanks for joining us here on RT International today. A breathtaking video has spread through the web showing two explorers setting foot inside a spectacular but seriously deadly volcano.
Now, the Vanuatu is an archipelago in the South Pacific Ocean. It's uh, one of the most, uh, world's most active and inaccessible volcanoes. The two American adventurers were among the first to make it to the very edge of the inferno. Amazing pictures there, which you can also see at rt.com. Uh, one of them told us here, though, uh, there are huge risks involved in this daring journey. There was a team of about six of us there on the volcano and required uh, a lot of infrastructure being in place. We had a big camp set up at the summit of the volcano. We had to be helicoptered in. The crater is about 400 meters deep, which is about the same depth as the Empire State Building is high. It was so spectacular and it was very surreal. Uh, it's a landscape that you don't normally see. There are no trees. It's all rock and volcanic ash and it's boiling lake of lava. And when you're down at the bottom, there is so much toxic gas coming from the lava that you have to wear a mask and you're getting acid rain on you because the gas interacts with the rain that's coming down. So the acid rain is burning your skin and stinging your eyes. And then the heat when you get up to the edge is so unbearable that without my silver protective heat suit, I couldn't even stand at the edge for more than about four or five seconds. So it's, it's just so many extremes all coming together in one place. It's the kind of location that I love to visit, but you don't want to stay there for very long. All right, still to come here on RT International, it's all in the name. And this is the message from those who see themselves as victims of discrimination. Later in the program, we tell you about a Mexican-American who changed his name in order to get a job. And an ambitious Russian project plans to set up a colony on the moon in just a couple of decades' time. We give you a preview of what it might look like. Stay with us. This is a normal day uh, during an escalation in Gaza. This is serious and people will have been killed right now. If we come out onto the roof now, ah, wow. That's another explosion over there. There's another interception over there. Everything is deadly quiet. The blue dot is us and we're surrounded by Ukraine on all three sides. And actually, here we are at the border. Right here, a shell landed right here. In this kilometer that is around, is that you can see several pieces of the aircraft. Do we have to remember that almost 300 people died, 295 to be precise. That was the site of especially intense bombing by Ukrainian forces just on Tuesday. A lot of bodies have been found. The organization of the Security Council of uh, Europe. Uh, Again, clashes have broken out in the French port city of Calais during an anti-immigration rally by far-right groups. They were protesting against the thousands of migrants from Africa who are trying desperately to reach the UK from Calais, where, of course, Britain has a border checkpoint. The crisis has already sparked a rift between Paris and London, uh, with the mayor of Calais demanding UK authorities do more to stop the influx of migrants. Harry Fear now with more on the rising cross-border tension. The situation for migrants and locals here in Calais has become increasingly desperate. Anti-migrant sentiment, like that being expressed behind me here, has soared since the city's migrants' problem has intensified. Riot police have been drafted in in order to manage this anti-migrant far-right protest with 450 demonstrators in attendance. The migrants are illegal, they are aggressive, they vandalize and make life unpleasant for locals. And the authorities aren't doing anything. Our message is clear. We want them all expelled. The estimated one to 2,000 migrants are squatting in brown and greenfield sites in poor and unsanitary conditions. Desperate to seek a new life in the UK, they're resorting to dangerous means to try to get into Britain. They come to Italy and we come to Cali, but the government of Cali uh, dislike to help us uh, and the police use of violence against the Sudanese. Everyone is under pressure. Too much migrants for maybe too less police. 
so they don't have time to be nice and cool with the migrants. A lot of migrants are injured by the police forces. This demonstration was moved to this less prominent location due to the authorities' security concerns. Even so, it's due to increased community tensions. Those sympathetic with the migrants' plight say they are fearful to speak out. Just earlier this year, in April, local authorities banned a similar protest like this one. France is part of the Schengen visa system, with no border restrictions between Italy and France's Calais. The UK hasn't yet involved itself in Calais' migrant problem, despite strong calls by the city's mayor to do so. Libya to Italy is survivor, but from Italy to here it's not difficult. But it's so difficult to control them after they come to Italy to France. So, but you have to stop them from their source, from the place where producing the immigrants. It seems no one's keen on taking responsibility for solving this developing crisis in London, in Paris, or in Calais itself. Harry Fear, RT, Calais, France. In the first six months of the year, French police arrested more than 7,000 migrants trying to get into Britain. The figure more than doubled the previous year. Now, to help control the migrants, the UK has offered Calais the steel fences used to protect the world leaders during the recent NATO summit in Wales. Well, as always, we've got loads of stories for you. We're online waiting for you right now at RT.com, including deadly diseases loose in American laboratories. Extremely dangerous toxins and bacteria such as ricin and the plague were forgotten or misplaced for up to 60 years. Those details on our website right now. Also, though, uh, some of America's most stunning married women will be in the Crimean Peninsula next year. They're defying the uh, tense political situation to hold the Mrs. America pageant in the region. Though it will take place right alongside the Mrs. Russia contest as well. Details right now at RT.com. So here's uh, something that brings a new meaning to making a name for yourself. A 32-year-old Mexican-American changed his first name from Jose to Joe to uh, try and improve his chances of getting a job. He told us why. To get the interviews, to get a response, to get any type of callback, it took Joe to get that. It just seemed to be a more easygoing or more attractive name that I think appealed to the eye of the employer. Joe just sounds like a more outgoing or sellable name. What it has done is just allowed me to uh, break in. The story of Jose Zamora has picked up broad support online as Twitter users slammed what many said was a clear case of discrimination in the workplace, while others wrote that they would take the issue further and bring more public attention to it. And according to a recent report, employers in the U.S. often discriminate against names that sound Hispanic or black, whether or not they realize it. And that's uh, despite national equal employment policies designed to prevent that. The study's findings are surprising. Those whose names suggest they might be white get 50% more callbacks for interviews than people with names from minority groups. All right, in brief, some other headlines from around the world. RT World Update time now. Dozens of protesters have clashed with police in the Chilean capital, Santiago. This during a march to remember victims of Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. Stones and Molotov cocktails were thrown by people. Security forces responded with water cannons and tear gas. Of course, Pinochet came to power in a coup supported by the U.S. government in 1973 and led the country until 1990. More than 3,000 people were killed during his rule. In Yemen, one person has been killed and dozens more wounded after riot police clashed with crowds of uh, Shia protesters in the capital, Sana'a. Tensions rose as demonstrators marched to a road lead, uh, that uh, links the city to the airport. For the past three weeks, protesters have been demanding the government resign and reinstate fuel subsidies after gas prices doubled in the region's poorest nation. An ambitious Russian project plans to set up a moon base. And the first steps to making it happen are planned for two years from now. A large part of the project will be carrying out groundbreaking research that could ultimately revolutionize key technologies here on Earth. Artis Ilya Petrenko has more on a, a new generation of space exploration. Apollo's 
lunar satellites, drilling rovers. Forget that old school stuff. A fully fledged colony on the moon is in the wings, and the leading space nations are teasing us with their ambitious projects. Like Russia, whose next moon program will culminate with setting up a permanent base in a couple of decades' time. We know about the four models it'll consist of, so we've let our imagination run wild. Of course, the first lunar colonists will need proper living conditions to eat, sleep, stay in shape and relax. Then there has to be a high-end lab for all the research. And one will need to generate power to keep things running. Finally, all of that will need to be connected. But it will all start on Earth with the building of a real prototype by 2018. When it comes to building on the Moon, the European Space Agency suggests 3D printers could take up the job and make it easier by using the Moon's soil. But why spend millions, if not billions, on building a lunar base? Well, first, the moon is just very close to us. It took Neil Armstrong only four days to reach it, so it's a good place to start with an extraterrestrial colony. The second reason is energy. There's a wealth of helium-3 up there. Bring the environmentally friendly isotope back to Earth and you've potentially got enough nuclear fusion to power our planet for at least 5,000 years. Then, the bright reflection of our atmosphere is an observatory's biggest enemy. But place a telescope on the hidden face of the moon, and the universe is as clear as it can be. Finally, lower gravity means easier launches. So a cosmodrome on the moon will serve as a perfect blasting off point for future interplanetary missions. All right, up next on RT International, as promised, are Sophie Shevanazzi and Sophie Co. Unless you're in the UK, good morning to you. You're about to be joined by Afshin Ratansi.